Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I don't know how to tag people in the chat room. Yeah, 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 yeah. Tag people in the chat room. Where it kind of like says that you're talking. Slash somebody's name at do you do at somebody's I think, name? I think the slash direct messages them. I think the yes. at mentions them. Ah, okay. There we go. And we are live just like that. Welcome to our private conversations. Don't they, don't they just thrill? Thrill a minute. Thrill a minute. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Starting in three. Actually, is our audio good? Check, 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 check. I'm good, Justin. Checkity, check, check. And Blair. Testing, one, two, three. There we go. Three hosts, three mics, three sounds from around and around and around. And we all sound great. Fantastic. Starting in a three, two, this is Twist. This Week in Science, episode number 742. <laughs> I can't talk today. Okay, let's try that one more time. Let's try Three, that over. Two, one. This is Twist. This Week in Science, episode number 742, recorded on Wednesday, October 9th, 2019. Science Nobility. I'm Dr. Kiki, and tonight we will fill your head with resistance, false memories, and mold pigs. But first... Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. The following program has persisted out of a love of science, a belief that the discovery of scientific knowledge, application of that knowledge in the world, and a constant effort and dedication to learn more make the world a better place to live. Through science... We accomplish the goals humanity sets for itself. But science is in trouble. Eh, there are powerful people who simply do not want scientists to speak publicly, want to prevent them from sharing their knowledge. Not that this is anything new, for science has always been in trouble this way. Religion was an early and persistent threat, demanding through violent retribution that no progress be made in science that did not capitulate to the prevailing dogma. Currently, the threat is political with redacted reports, researcher retaliation, and silencing of results. And it's happening at an increasingly inhibiting pace. Maybe what we need now is a new legal framework, a constitutional amendment for science, a protection for the funding and findings of science, one that separates once and for all the political interests of politicians and their donors from the work of scientists. Separation of science and state Freedom of Publication Act, one that once and for all prevents the willful disregard of scientific findings by political appointees and instead puts the knowledge in the hands of This Week in Science. Coming up next. I've got the kind of mind that can't get enough. I want to learn. Kiki and Blair. And a good science to you too, Justin, Blair, and everyone out there. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Science. We are back again to thrill you with sights, well not sights, sounds of science. Stories to fill that mental visual space in your brains with curiosity. All right, I have stories, well, you know, I'm going to be talking about the Nobel Prizes tonight. That's one thing for sure. I also have stories about false memories and zebra stripes. Again? Again, bringing it back. Wait. Yeah, you. Oh, you're going to love this one. Justin, what did you bring? 
Oh my gosh, uh, there was so much to choose from. I've got uh, antibiotic resistant chickens, uh, tropical Mexican miracle cures, human regeneration, mold pigs, as you mentioned, and a 400,000 year old camp. I, know, I think the mold pigs has won for me tonight. That's the that that's the one I have curiosity about. I gotta know. And Blair, what is in the animal corner? Oh my goodness! Well, I am so excited that my plane landed just in time for me to run to the show tonight. And I have Yay. brought from various hotels and airports uh, some science Diseases. news. And no. that is well, luckily that's the that's the beauty of the teleconferencing, I suppose. But. Um, <laughs> I have brought uh, robots saving animals, TV saving animals, and bird pee. Bird pee. Oh, yeah. Awesome. The birds don't pee, but let's talk about it. We're going to talk later. about it. Yeah. Wait, we'll, what? We'll talk okay, about what passes really through curious. that cloaca. Yeah. <sighs> yes. As we jump into the show, I would love to remind you all that you can subscribe to the This Week in Science podcast everywhere podcasts are found. Just look for This Week in Science. You can also go to twist.org for information about the show and to find out about the 2020 Twist Blair's Animal Corner calendar. You can pre-order that now. But it is now time for... <gasps> Nobility. <gasps> so as I get started here uh, talking about the Nobel Prizes, once again, last year it was like this exciting year because there were two women in the sciences who got prizes in the Nobel Prizes and everyone was like, yes, it's a step in the right direction. More women getting awards. And this year it is a bunch of men again which is great they're all very well deserving and these are amazing discoveries that deserve re recognition for what they have done but you know it would be nice to see a few more women on the list we're gonna keep we, we've said it before as the nobel prizes continue and as they look at things differently and as more women are dominant in their fields in the sciences as they have been for the last couple of decades and growing you will see more and more women receive nobel prizes it's going to happen there is traction the first prize for the nobels that I want to announce, if you haven't read already, the Chemistry Prize. It has been presented to three researchers, John B. Goodenough, mm. <laughs> M. Stanley Whittingham, and Akira, Akira Yoshino for developing lithium-ion batteries. The batteries that we have in our phones, the batteries that catch on fire on planes, the batteries that are in our laptops, <laughs> the batteries that allow our rechargeable, portable lives to take place these days. These gentlemen were responsible for developing lithium-ion batteries, not all together. They didn't all collaborate. This award is given to these researchers for the sequence of iterations that each of them made on the previous researchers work so the original work started with john goodenough was then iterated upon by whittingham and akira yoshino made the final developments that allowed us to have these amazing devices portable yeah, it's, yeah it's, just throwing uh, things around here it's just an throw. interesting uh <laughs> Way that they've done it on this on this award. It's it's rare that you see a physical invention uh, being part of a Nobel, uh, and and the and it's maybe for largely the reason that you you know you were mentioning is that the 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 iteration of an invention uh, has so many uh, portions to it, and in uh, previous uh, discoveries and previous uh, accelerations of knowledge that are required to get to the next step. So I think it's pretty neat. They realize this is a very impactful uh, uh, invention in chemistry or discovery in chemistry that's allowed this, and they've gone back and yeah. grabbed some of these key figures and 
and put them together. So I, mean, I like the way they did that. Yeah. And I did misspeak. It was Stanley Whittingham that during the oil crisis in the 1970s laid the foundation for the lithium ion battery technology. He was researching superconductors, discovered an energy rich material to, that he used to create an innovative cathode in a lithium battery. This was titanium disulfide that could intercalate or house lithium ions. And then good enough uh, predicted that that cathode would have greater potential if it was using a metal oxide instead of a metal sulfide. So he changed the chemistry a bit. And then Akira Yoshino created the first commercially viable battery in 1985. These things have been around for a long time. And they're, they don't look like they're going anywhere anytime soon. And, there, and there's a perfect also example of the handoff of shared knowledge where, oh, look, I found this really cool thing. I eh, don't know what to do with it, but it's really cool. And then somebody else picks up like, oh, I've been looking for something that does exactly that. I just couldn't conceive of it. And here, and then somebody's like, oh, well, let's make it. <laughs> it's actually yeah. It. But I mean, that's like yeah. we, we talk about CRISPR all the time. And that's exactly mm -hmm. what has happened with CRISPR. It's people iterating on the technology, um, you know, the finding that bacteria have this this mechanism and then how can we use this and what can we do with this and it's still being iterated on and it's going it's an amazing tool to science now it's and, and none of this comes, takes place if, if this knowledge isn't shared uh so right. it's the big thing you know if this is, yeah. is if this is siloed and uh some uh you know, patented or not uh someplace where somebody's trying to develop uh, and maybe it never turns into a battery <laughs> this cafe initially gets discovered right for the Nobel Prize in Physics for 2019, this was awarded one half to James Peebles for theoretical discoveries in physical cosmology. Basically, the Big Bang. He's got some. Uh, he he did a lot of work in the Big Bang, and the other half went to Michael Mayer and Didier Didier Queloz for the discovery of an exoplanet orbiting a solar type star. So this is the first Nobel Prize given for um, exoplanets, which is, you know, in itself pretty impressive. Um, I was looking up some information about who had discovered the first exoplanet. The first confirmed discovery of an exoplanet uh, was was January 1992. Radio astronomers Alexander Wolksan and Dale Frail announced two planets that they discovered around a pulsar. But it was Michael Mayer and Didier Queloz of the University of Geneva who they announced the first definitive detection of an exoplanet orbiting a main sequence star. And the, uh, the, the technique that they used, the technology that they used, uh, really laid the groundwork for what is now the modern era of exoplanetary discovery, uh, the the high resolution high resolution spectroscopy that they yet that they used uh, were was able to further advances as it was used more and more. Um, but it's interesting that the the people who got the award were not the first discoverers of the exoplanet of an exoplanet. So maybe sometimes if you get there first, it's not even enough. Hmm. <laughs> Interesting. And and so and we found so many of them too that we've become very blasé. Like, Absolutely. okay, is it one? We only care. Can we live on it? Ah, it's the gravity's too much. We've gotten very very specific, very snobbish uh, about <laughs> about talking about exoplanets. It's it's really now it's so hard to even even contemplate the idea that exoplanets at one point were just an idea that we didn't know they yeah. that they existed. I mean, I, I feel like, oh, of course there's exoplanets around other stars. Of course there are exoplanets. We're finding them all over the place. That's what I was thinking. Um, I don't understand what, why that's, but, if we knew that stars were suns, basically, right? Like, right? seems. But you have to, you know, it's science. Well, we must yeah. confirm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. and you have, <laughs> sure. if, you, if you go, you don't have to go back that far. Uh, maybe it's 100 years. Uh, when we knew of uh, one other galaxy. 
Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah. We, yeah. we 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 now have photographs of billions of them. Uh, it's it's really uh, uh, yeah. yeah. We're, Science. It's pretty hard to yeah. break through those barriers where we admit that we're not special. I feel like so even if we said, okay, oh. there are other suns, but they don't have planets. I mean, that's that's just us, right? Oh, I found it a complete <laughs> relief. <Just us. laughs> like, oh thank goodness. Oh, thank goodness. This for really you, isn't the, but I feel like for many planet. others. <laughs> when I look around, I'm like, thank goodness. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, There's James Peebles, we have to we have to say thank goodness that he came up with the theoretical fra framework for the Big Bang model and his theoretical tools and calculations allowed an interpretation of traces of radiation in the universe to uh, allow us to discover what is in our universe. That his results showed a universe in which just five percent of its content is known. The matter which con constitutes stars, planets, and trees. All of that baryonic, visible matter. The rest is unknown dark matter. And still is a mystery. Don't you forget it, people. We still don't know what the rest is made of. Even though people sound very convincing in books and on podcasts. I would, wouldn't that make you sort of have, have really questioned your results, so, uh <laughs> So, I discovered... Uh, uh, the only 5% of the universe is actually made of stuff we can understand. Yeah, right. Okay, go look again. No, no, go look again. Uh, what is that? Do over. Um, and finally, the award for physiology or medicine has been awarded to William Kalin Jr., Sir Peter Radcliffe, and Greg L. Semenza for discoveries of how cells sense and adapt to oxygen availability. And they identified molecular machinery regulating the activity of genes inside the cell's metabolis metabolism uh, to varying levels of oxygen. So it lets us understand what they did discovering this oxygen sensing machinery uh, allows us to really be able to Understand how cancer cells work in their anaerobic or aerobic situations. Uh, they, they help us understand how changes in oxygen availability could, uh, could influence growth of cellular populations or of just living organisms. What, uh, what is uh, necessary? The researchers discovered a gene, the EPO gene. They studied it and how it gets regulated and mediates the response to hypoxia. Ratcliffe studied oxygen-dependent regulation of this gene. They found this mechanism was present in, vir present in virtually all tissues all over the body, so everywhere. How does our body deal with it? Yeah, oxygen sensing. And this is one of the things. Oxygen is important to life. And so this mechanism is inherently Im important to life. Yes. Uh, moving on from the Nobels, there are more awards to be given next year. And let's see if some more ladies make the cut. We will... We will be hoping for that. In the meantime, funding of scientists is something that's very important to uh, researchers actually being able to do groundbreaking work and actually make these impacts that end up, uh, end up changing our sense of the universe around us. We've known for a long time that black scientists are less likely to receive funding from the National Institutes of Health. National Institutes of Health are one of the major funders of medical and health research in the United States. And a, a study was done looking at some 157,000 grant application proposals submitted between 2011 and 2015 for what are called the R01 grants. And these R01 grants are very large grants that form the ability of labs to be able to to do the work that they do. They really 
give that they 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 get let they let labs run and exist. Um, the researchers placed each proposal into one of 150 topic areas and examined factors that could influence the final outcome, finding that three contribute to the gap that in in funding that is actually see, seen. This is called the Ginther Gap. They found that it, the score, whether or not it's scored, more than half of all proposals are, don't get any score at all. What score it receives, which this, this all kind of makes sense, the higher the score, the better it does, the more likely it is to get funding. And the, the, the factor that had the highest contribution, the topic choice, uh, was topic choice. So what were the researchers applying to actually study? Yeah, and so the question now is what are, how are the perceptions or the, uh, the priorities of the black research community and how do they differ or how do they, how do they compare to the priorities of NIH and the NIH proposal analyzing committees, because mm-hmm. um, something is not lining up. And this study doesn't actually get into that and does not answer that question, right. but it okay. raises that question for right. sure now. So in, in my field, in the field of environmental education or informal education, depending on what bucket you're looking at, um, there is this large conversation happening right now around diversity, equity, and inclusion, and yes. specifically in trying to get people that aren't just white women teaching at science museums and zoos and aquariums, because that's everybody who's doing it pretty much, right? Yeah. And why is that? And how much of it is based on the fact that that's just who's currently doing it, so other people don't see themselves in that line of work? Or what's what a lot of places are doing now is they're actually bringing in outside consultants to look at their hiring process, to look at their posting process, and specifically to look at job descriptions. And it yeah. turns out that there's a lot of stuff that people put in job descriptions that can alienate entire groups of people um, that we don't even realize. And uh, so I see, you know, lots of talk in the in the chat room saying, I can't believe this is an issue. I, I don't think that necessarily it's always intentional. And I think that a lot of times there are these kind of grandfathered in yeah. expectations that we don't realize are causing these larger systematic effects that are keeping us from being a better reflection of society as a whole. And so I think yep. uh, the more I hear about stuff like this, I think it, it just, it brings us that further to light that we need to bring somebody into our systems that are not representative and really take an outside look and see what biases we're accidentally bringing into our, into our hiring and our, you know, scholarship aw- uh, awards and all these sorts of things. Absolutely. And yeah. this is uh, this is definitely an issue here. And uh, the way that the committees who review these proposals are put together, they review a bunch of different things. And and race is not really the factor, but there's something that they're looking at. But something is coming out in the in the topics that are being chosen um, by the people of color that is di- that is different and, or that doesn't align in the same way. And uh, one idea that's being uh, bandied about is that uh, that there are more studies related to actually applying our existing knowledge about health and medicine to communities and the systems that are in place to improve mm-hmm. systems that we have, whereas the NIH focus is potentially more so on basic science. Right. And f- making new discoveries as opposed to taking the knowledge that we already have to improve the way that we do things. And this is this is a potential explanation, but it as of yet doesn't have um, an, any any evidentiary weight behind it. Uh, but the 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 researchers from this group say that at this at this point in time, um, the reviewers are are not consciously looking at at these things in a part- in, in a particular way and that it's there's maybe just some differences in this in the system and the way the system is set up mm-hmm. that need to be addressed in the exact way that you were talking about Blair. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. so one of the other things that's a factor in this often, and uh, we we did it, we covered a study about this ten years ago or something, uh, is that there's also um, a a tribalism in how you hear about jobs. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and so and so if uh, if your uh, friend circle is not very diverse, your uh, the jobs you are most likely to hear about are jobs that people in your friend circle with their lack of diversity are more likely to be sort of the thing. So you will end up with a lot of white males in Silicon Valley at the, a, a company that is hired mostly white yeah. males. Um, right. But if there is a more diverse culture there, there's more people who will hear about jobs and know to apply for things and this sort of thing. Um, well, which kind of makes sense to maybe maybe it's a the white woman circle of of tribe is is are, got those jobs early and is referring other women to do them okay mm-hmm. but when you get into when you get into this is uh this is a uh these are these are grant funding statements or requests that are coming through in just document form um you can still apply this because who knows to apply for these in the first place or what the application process is, there is still going to be a tribe of people who know to do applications, but yeah. in the percentage that is getting, then you're starting to also talk about what is, what are, uh, tr- what do these specific tribes care about? Um, what are the topics that are being discussed? So yeah. if, 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 and we don't know that there is, because I guess they haven't talked about specifically in this, if there is a specific different subset of issues that are being uh, of concern from the, um, um, from the, the community of color, as it were, in the scientific field, if they're actually uh, attacking different issues or, or, or what that's uh, about. But that would be an interesting dive to find out. If there really is a philosophical approach that is different uh, in some way. Uh, or Yeah, or just not represented. You know, it's just, yeah, not represented yet. So it's uh, definitely an area across the board that needs improvement uh, to see greater representation and to see, uh, you know, greater diversity in who gets funded, ideas that are getting funded, and you know, let's do the best we can. And this this research is great for pushing that forward. And hopefully there will be more studies that actually delve into these kinds of questions more deeply. Mm -hmm. This is This Week in Science. Hey, Justin, you want to tell me a story? Is it time for the thing you did say stuff? Okay. Yes, do it. Uh, So humans have been overusing antibiotics quite some time now uh, to the point that antibiotics are becoming somewhat resistant to our efforts. Uh, uh, It turns out though, uh, we are not alone in this. Animals also have been overusing antibiotics at an alarming rate, it turns out. So this is uh, uh, nearly a thousand publications and unpublished veterinary reports from around the world were used to create a map of antimicrobial resistance in low to middle income countries, livestock, they focused on bacteria, E. coli, uh, Campylobacter, Salmonella, Staphylococcus, all of which uh, cause serious diseases in both animals and humans. Since 2000, uh, from the results of the study, since 2000, meat production has accelerated by more than 60% in Africa and Asia, by 40% in South America, as countries in those continents uh, get a taste for meat in a higher degree. More than half of the world's chickens and pigs, just a fun fact, are in Asia currently. Uh, The study found that between 2000 and 2018, the proportion of antibiotics showing rates of resistance above 50% in developing countries increased in chickens from 15% to 41%, and in pigs from 13% to 34%, uh, meaning that the the percentage of uh, livestock populations that are becoming majority resistant to antibiotics is increasing about threefold in two decades. So uh, researchers found that antibiotic resistance in livestock was the most widespread in China, India, and Brazil, or China and India with Brazil and Kenya emerging as the, as the follow-ups. And meat production accounts for this, I, I guess I should have known, 
makes sense. Meat production accounts for 73% of global antibiotic use. Yeah. And yeah, and, and this is what sort of made these large scale farming operations even possible. Uh, because in the olden times, you would never house as many pigs, chickens, cows, what have you together. Because if one or two of them got sick, all of them would get sick. And then you would have a bunch of sick, dead animals on your hands. So one of the one of the things they're pointing out, and this is a tough, this is the tough ask, or it's the in any regard, is that researchers are suggesting that developing nations should take action to restrict the use of human antibiotics in farm animals, and that the affluent nations should support a transition to sustainable farming. So it's this is this is a tough ask in two ways. It's asking uh nations who aren't profiting from these industries to pay uh come up with a fund and international biosafety biosecurity funds to address the issue but then it's also asking developing nations who are already not in great financial shape perhaps in terms of the money they can afford to put into food and raise food for the population to take on an additional expense so chances are nothing will happen right um <laughs> But this is this is sort of an alarming uh, uh, state of uh, state of things for the rate of this increase uh, and the idea that it's unregulated too. Like we have we've only just really gotten to the point where we understand how much we need to regulate antibiotics in developing nations, and now to see that a huge that all of our efforts locally are likely to be undone. Uh, by the proliferation of of these farming techniques uh, globally, it's it's uh, it's sort of like having to deal with our younger selves in a weird way. You know, where where we <laughs> right, were, exactly, where, we, where were we were twenty something years ago, that yeah. we're like, ah, okay, that was a bad idea. Now we've got the solution. Oh, but our old selves are still here, right alongside of us, causing the problem. So and it makes I, it difficult. We should be addressing that and oh, oh we've figured this out let us help you do it in a different way let it, i mean the, the issue is a lot of agriculture in north america is still using massive amounts of antibiotics maybe it's more regulated than it was at one point but i don't i, I don't think so <laughs> i think yeah I but think... it also it also sort of indicates that you know because these things uh can uh, occasionally swap from animal to human. Uh, and if we have all of the efforts of preventing antibiotics from becoming ineffective in our human population could easily be outdone by creating uh, highly resistant strains in animals that then move over. So, yeah. And uh, there's a, the, so there's the, has the antibiotic. That's written all over. Yeah, it absolutely does. But even beyond that, there's I, I was just looking, um, I, I remembered a study that I that I saw as I was researching for the show this week. Um, but they're they're finding that the animals who get the antibiotics like cows, uh, when they when they defecate, so it has an effect on the soil. And so researchers at Co Colorado State University and University of U of Idaho discovered that there were changes in carbon allocation and carbon use efficiency. Um, there, the study is titled, Prolonged Exposure to Manure from Livestock Administered Antibiotics Decreases Ecosystem Carbon Use Efficiency and Alters Nitrogen Cycling. So uh, the antibiotics have a trickle-down effect on the ecosystems these animals live in as well. And it, so there are multiple layers of, <laughs> of bad here. <laughs> yeah, there's some analogy of something running downhill. Yep. So basically what, uh, the, as, as we are losing antibiotics uh, uh, solutions to things, this is, of course, the predicted uh, doom of the world over the next 30 years. However, Yay! there is good news. Uh, thanks to the tropical forests of Mexico coming to the rescue, a new hope for antibiotics has emerged and it uh, has some unique properties that could make it actually pretty attractive in, uh, in agriculture as well. So it's, I don't know, I can't pronounce this, 
Phaselicin? Phaselix? Phaselicin? Is uh, P with a PH for the f it's uh, it is the <laughs> compound. What are you calling I don't know. Phaselicin? Yeah, it could be lysin. It's going to be a household word in 10 years. Yeah. It'll be a household word in 10 years. We'll figure it out then. Antibiotic <laughs> resistance. Z uh, for short. There you go. This is, this is uh, Konstantin uh, Severinov, a molecular biologist and biochemist at Rutgers University in New Brunswick. Antibiotic resistance is a huge problem in both medicine and agriculture, and continuing searches for new antibiotics are very important as they may provide leads for the future antibacterial agents. Uh, this compound is, uh, is found in uh, found in root nodules of wild beans in the in tropical forests of Mexico. It's unusual because it is uh, an antibiotic that is produced by a symbiotic soil bacteria that fixes nitrogen for the plants and helps them uh, keep also helps them keep microbes away. So it's doing two tasks. So it's fixing nitrogen and keeping off, keeping uh, unbeneficial microbes away from the roots of the bean. It, it's, it has this really unique action though, in that it can, it can actually get in uh, and, and shut down uh, the microRNA in the hmm. attacking bacteria. So oh, it's only one. Yeah, it's only it's the only the second peptide known to do this. So yeah, here it is. Uh, not only could this antibiotic, uh, it yeah, it's uh, where's the? I'm sorry, I'm I I've lost my place in my story, but it is. Uh, Yeah, it it actually goes in to enters the 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 bacteria that's trying to attack the root, binds to the ribosomes, and and basically messes its ability to synthesize proteins. And yeah, so this is this is really this is really a shutdown operation in a completely different way than most of our antibiotics have been working. Uh, it essentially shuts down the machinery inside of the micro so uh and in in this it's also uh, it looks like it can be useful and and to the plant in terms of growing and proliferating and making a healthier crop so this is this is a one two this is something that could actually be used in agriculture as a nitrogen fixer that could also be mm -hmm. uh, a natural probiotic for plants that you're growing and if this peptide can be reapplied, it can be used as an antibiotic perhaps in humans and cows and pigs and every, anything else. Um, and it's one of those things that you wonder how well there, there would be a defense for it. If this can bind to a yeah. ribosome, this is, this is attacking before, uh, before a defense, defense system uh, the, with the machinery that the defense system might generate new proteins, novel proteins, something other than uh, what was affecting that bacteria in the first place as the overcoming of, of the antibiotic. But if you're shutting down the machinery before it has a chance to react, uh, that's, that's a really powerful, uh, really powerful way of going about it. So yeah, really I'm interesting. Just... Yeah. yeah, that that is really interesting. I mean, it's kind of like it's getting in there and gumming up the works. So you have the RNA coming off the DNA, and then that RNA is going to go over to the ribosome to get turned into a protein. But then this this thing gets in there and says, mm -mm, nope, stop. Just stop right now. That's not going to happen. And so you don't get any translation. You don't get any of that actual production of the gene into a protein to to do what it needs to do, and so this seems like a mechanism that could be that could be taken and turned used, like for not just one purpose or one species, but maybe multiple. If we can get if you can get it in to attack and stop the translation, it could could potentially be. Uh, I mean, who knows? It could be a really good biocontrol agent. 
Uh, it could also like... accidentally wipe out your entire microbiome, right? <laughs> Well, well the, uh, yeah, the, okay. <laughs> what? <laughs> I just, it sounds like it's something no. that if you found a way to make it kind of more universally effective, it could accidentally just kind of like, <sighs> especially since if you're keeping it from being able to replicate, then that means that it, in theory, would avoid resistance, right? Yes, but it's, but it, the thing to keep in mind is this is a peptide that is created by a bacteria acting on a root uh, of, right. of so, so, so this is not a, a living thing that is going to be proliferating if you right, if, of course, if of course. will be in a set amount, right? Uh, I think I might have some pretty interesting research uh, applications too. That would be pretty fun. Uh, being able to go in and shut down ribosomes for periods of time might be, might be a very useful tool. And I mean, yeah. it's also possible that, you know, it. with everything we've learned about the microbiome, for example, you could potentially just want to nuke your entire microbiome and start over <laughs> no so no, you no. could do that <laughs> don't do that <laughs> i mean, I mean if you have if, a really bad gut problem you could just pretty yeah much I, no, your, there, I, you're right your yeah gut, absolutely right? yeah so, there actually are yeah. short of drinking bleach this would be much more effective yeah but i mean then we're t saying what we've we, this is how people have addressed before is actually taking antibiotics mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. yeah to, to sort of cl do the, the antibiotic cleanse uh, but, you know, again, running out of antibiotics, uh, here's a new potential uh, that can maybe save the planet. The next 30 years or so. Fingers crossed. So you gave us some bad news and then some good news. And so I try to I try to balance it. Try to balance it. It's good. And, and then now it's time for Blair's Animal Corner. <sighs> Biped, milliped, no pet at all. If you want to hear about animals, she's your girl. Except for giant pandas and squirrels. And a What you got, Blair? Oh, my goodness. Well, I'm excited. I have all good news this week in Yay. the Animal Corner. Um, I, w I may have been uh, kind of inspired by the past... 10 days that I spent talking to people researching out in the wild, but I have a couple of really cool stories about animal research that's going on. Um, so the first one is actually about using drones for conservation. And of course, we've talked in the past about how drones are being used to monitor rhinos in the wild so that um, they can be protected and, and we make sure that people aren't poaching them. And drones have been used to follow animal movement and migration. Um, the latest use for a drone in the wild is to weigh whales. Weighing what? whales with a drone, how, yes. How do you do that? What? Well, I'm going to go ahead and put air quotes around the word way. <laughs> Let me right. explain what's actually happening here. So this is researchers from Aarhus Institute of Advanced Studies in Denmark. I don't sorry. And Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, HUI, in the U.S. And they have found a way to accurately estimate the weight of free-living whales using only aerial images taken by drone. So this is an estimation of weight. Um, they are not actually weighing the whales with a drone. I'm not exactly sure how that would work. Um, I'm imagining some sort of amphibious flying drone with a sling, but no, that's not what this is. It's just a picture taking device. So they can measure the body length, width, and height of free living Southern right whales. And they took these photographs they measured these different metrics on the whales. They were able to find a model that accurately calculated body volume and mass of the whales using those images. So obviously the way that we've only measured whale weight in the past has been by weighing dead or stranded individuals on beaches, which is a hard way to measure that because um, at least in the case of the dead beached whales, they're bloated, decay has set in, their, their weight to measurements are not exactly what they should be for a living whale. So it, it's not a good place to start. <laughs> um, so this is a really big kind of jump ahead in that. They think that also they'll be able to track individuals and watch their, their 
dimensions grow over time so that they can have better understandings of how whales grow and how they gain their weight and what a healthy whale looks like so that when we're looking at conservation concerns with wild whales with wild whales we can have a good idea of what it's supposed to look like and kind of go from there so this is all very new it's very new. I mean, the ability mm -hmm. to be able to have this kind of monitoring, uh, we've never had this ability before. This is really interesting. Yeah. So they're saying that they can now look at the growth of known aged individuals, calculate their body mass increase over time. That's kind of what I was talking about. But then extrapolate that into energy requirements for growth and take that information, look at daily energy requirements for whales, and calculate how much prey they need to consume. So now if you're thinking about ecosystem needs, you can actually see, okay, if this fishery is declining, this is what it might mean. Or um, a lot of, you know, the right whale, I think, is a baleen fish. So, um, you know, that's a that's a whole different conversation is about the, yeah. The, yeah, the, the plankton that they're eating or the krill and then um, kind of how that's affected. So... This is a really cool first step um, to see kind of how we can monitor these animals in the wild that are really hard to get anywhere near without impacting their migrations. And now we can just kind of fly overhead. Hopefully the drones aren't too loud for them overhead and they can uh, take those pictures from afar, track individuals and really get a good sense for whale conservation efforts from there. That's cool. And we'll get a mm -hmm. lot of amazing top-down uh, whale pictures out of it. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, check your Google. Be so many pretty pictures. <laughs> Hope they're open source. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, so that's the whale drones. Um, the whale of a tail. Yes. Now, speaking of uh, animals on film, let's say, uh, this is a study looking at nature documentaries and whether they make a difference. Um, so I was very interested to see this because, you know, there's been documentaries coming out, especially now with streaming platforms. They're much more accessible than they ever have been in the past. You don't have to be watching your local PBS station at just the right time to see your nature docs, right? So you can log on anytime and you can watch um, a nature documentary. And so uh, the question there is, is this helping animal conservation? Is it helping wildlife conservation? Is it helping with knowledge of these animals? Or is it just entertaining? Which I had my own ideas going into it, but I think it's really interesting that they did a study really to look at the impact of these documentaries. So this is an Irish study um, from University of College, uh, University College Cork, um, and they wanted to look specifically at Planet Earth 2, which came out in 2016, narrated by David Attenborough, of course. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to track how the documentary changed attitudes towards nature by measuring audience reactions and engagement on social media. So the first thing they did is that they found uh, that the show itself, when they studied it, had very little time allocated to conservation topics. Um, and that those that were mentioned generated little reaction in audiences. So they're thinking, uh oh, this isn't good. Sounding like just entertainment, animal facts. But they found that the show generated active interest in the species it portrayed. So not just watching it for fun, but taking the next step in finding out more. And that that next step sometimes lasted up to six months hmm. after the initial viewing of Planet Earth 2. So they looked at the species that appeared in the show, how much screen time was dedicated to the species and what group of animals they belong to. Then they searched Twitter for 35,000 tweets with the hashtag planet earth Two to see if they were reacting on Twitter. And then the last step, I love this, is that they analyzed the number of Wikipedia hits for the pages of each species. So through all this, they could assess uh, how audiences were engaging with the individual species, with the show, and who was looking for further information. And then the, the very last thing they did was look for donations to charities related to those species or habitats. So as I mentioned, the interest in species lasted up to six months after watching the show. Um, but they assumed that certain types of animals would have a bigger reaction than others, like mammals versus insects. 
but they found that the actual link to how much people looked into an individual species was all about how long that species was on screen. And this was on Twitter, how much they were talking about it, and also how much they were looking it up on Wikipedia. Um, A really good example of that is that there's a huge scene in Planet Earth 2 where there's a swarm of locusts. And you wouldn't consider locusts to be charismatic by any means, but people searched a lot about locusts. locusts after this very extensive scene on them in the show. Um, The effect also, love this, was independent of how well or poorly known the species was beforehand. So a lot of people know things about giraffes. They might not know a lot about racer snakes, which the Planet Earth 2 was the famous clip that most people who've spent some time on YouTube have seen where the racer snakes actually chase iguanas and there's a big iguana ball or a a snake ball around the iguanas. It's harrowing tale. It's one of the most traumatizing things I have ever watched on television. Yeah, But the thing is racer snakes got to eat, you know? Um, But anyway, don't care. (laughs) (laughs) This is their example of a species being lesser known. Racer snakes didn't even have a Wikipedia page before the show. And two days after that segment aired, they did. So there was an immediate spike in a desire to have that space, and then people started visiting it. The last bit of the research here was looking at donations. And as I probably could have told you, (laughs) donations did not follow watching Planet Earth 2. The the caveat they lead to that is that in other shows like on Our Planet, which was on Netflix, they have a direct link to the World Wildlife Fund. And so they have this hypothesis that because Planet Earth 2 didn't have a direct link to any one conservation organization, Mm -hmm. people didn't know where to go to funnel their interest. And so if they repeated this study with that, they might see a spike. But I think also we need to remember that there are huge competitors for people's dollars and efforts in giving donations. And that... um, not getting a donation to a specific species or conservation topic is not a loss. If people are spending the next six months looking up locusts, <laughs> that is a huge win in the eyes of conservation because um, awareness breeds interest, interest breeds caring, caring brings cons- breeds conservation in action, right? So it's all kind of part of the spectrum. And if this is how we can really see there is an impact in people's interest and exploration into a species or habitat, that's a huge win. Um, but the the last thing they kind of mention based on this study is that based on all of these metrics that they found and these links that they found, more time on these shows, their suggestion is, should be given to endangered species. And that's because if the amount of time you spend looking at an animal and researching them and looking at what they need and if they need help from you, if that's going to be directly related to the amount of screen time that they get, then they they need to give good screen time to endangered species. Of course, this is a whole separate thing where like, I don't think you should be talking about endangered species. You should be talking about habitats that are endangered or or um, are at a conservation threat. That's really the conversation we need to be having. But regardless, yes, we should be focusing our uh, limited attention with these nature docs since we know we're hooking people uh, for good is basically what this is saying. And one thing I would point out Mm -hmm. is that also what is required is a good narrator. Yes, David I feel, David Amber, I mean, I I get the the, the tone of the voice and a little bit of the action and everything else Mm -hmm. and the steady pace. It's just, I'm, ooh, yeah, I'm really interested. Oh, he's selling me a a laundry detergent? I didn't even realize. Like, that's really that good. Uh, Because you can imagine, like, the the racer snake iguana scene being done by me where I'm like, and the iguana is heading out looking for lunch. And, oh my God, run, run a little iguana, run. Like, it, you know, it might get, generate some excitement, but it might not generate an actual interest in the animals if somebody is just screaming. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I, I think one of the things about David Attenborough too, that is so special 
I can take a second is that if you watch some of his original TV show where he's on camera and he's out in the wild, he's always getting down on the floor with the animals and he gets so excited when he sees this stuff and you can hear it in his voice too, which I think is a really big part of it, right? Is that he has a very measured tone when kind of scary things are happening, but he also is, is, audibly excited to share this stuff with you which there is hopefully love that, that yeah. comes through yeah. on the show as well <laughs> ah, i hope so, so. Yeah. i do hope so yeah and this is I, I find this really interesting but it does get at you know a point of fundraising for so many organizations it is about the ask and it is about telling people where to go and mm-hmm. how to help And if the goal of these nature programs is to help endangered species, is Mm -hmm. to help conservation efforts, then the show needs to be aligned Mm -hmm. with certain things that people can do. Yeah, you got to have that next step, right? You have to give people something to do. That's that's, that's a good kind of tenet of education, right? Never present a problem without a solution. Mm-hmm. And, and an easy way to do that is something like a through a Netflix or something that is online content where you can actually have a button. You know, the, yeah. the thing that I thought of when you, as soon as you mentioned the, the Netflix, the, I thought of the zoo. You know, I, I don't know if your zoo does it. You get the little metal token and you can drop oh, it in. Oh, yeah, like, yeah. They give you a selection of one or, two, you know, three animals that might be endangered or, uh, or need fundraising. You drop your little token in there, mm-hmm. and then supposedly somewhere down the line they get a you know for whoever collects the most. They tokens, get a giant they, check. <laughs> a prop <laughs> the check. animal gets a <laughs> they giant hand it to a zebra, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, uh, but you could uh, have a very easy tie-in where, like, you're talking about the you know this iguana or what have you, and have a little one dollar donation thing mm-hmm. to protect that they pop up, and you can. Yeah. Click it and it comes right out of the Netflix account on the next bill or something simple that way uh, that not only makes it uh, ties the connection to there needs to be help and go look at this later. And six months from now, hopefully you've done it. But while you're looking at this, here's the thing you can do right there in the moment. Yeah. And I go. really yeah. do. Netflix, are you listening? That's what I was going to say. <laughs> I hope that Amazon, Netflix, the uh, the platforms that are streaming these programs, that they can incorporate that. Are you listening? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And I will just mention in the chat room, just because it makes me feel very warm and fuzzy, Noodles did mention, I looked into polar bears after last week's show. So there we go. Ugh. So it's You're all having about the effect, Blair. Oh. You're having the you got the Edinburgh effect going on over there. Oh my goodness! Edinburgh. Dream come Edinburgh. true. Yeah. Oh well, a dream come true for me is to get to the break. No, I'm really <laughs> enjoying the show. And I, I'm, I'm about to lose power. I got to go plug in. Oh, you go plug in. I'm gonna take us to the break. It is time for the break right now. Stay tuned, everybody for a bit more of This Week in Science coming up in just a few moments. We can't explain things you've heard with more than intuition A line of reason shows the way to go Thank you for sharing your time with us and for being a part of the This Week in Science community. Did you know that our calendars are available for pre-order? That's right. I have been trying to let you all know that our calendars are available and you can get yourself on the list to get a 2020 Blair's Animal Corner calendar from Twiss. In time for the holidays, one for you, one for a friend. Sounds about right. Blair has made a stained glass effect this year for her art, and we are excited about all of the pieces of art that will be in the calendar this year. So go to twist.org and click on the, what is, is is it a hypnotoad, Blair? The hypnotoad? It is a horned frog. 
Oh, sorry. The horned it's a frog. real species, actually. Yeah. <laughs> okay. The 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 cover of the calendar, the horned frog, as it has been for the what last four five years? Four years? Well, I, my four first years? one was twenty sixteen. So sixteen, mm-hmm. seventeen, eighteen, nineteen. This is the fifth anniversary. Fifth this is anniversary the fifth year. calendar. There we go. Uh-huh. You can pre-order yours now over at Twist dot org that's so exciting and while you're there if you have not subscribed to twist you can click on the orange subscribe button and that will open up your options to youtube itunes google play you can send other people over to twist.org to be able to uh, subscribe easily in that manner Uh, or you can go to whatever location you like best for listening to your podcasts additionally if you are interested in helping to support our uh, our financial needs for running the show, uh, you can head over to Patreon. Patreon, we're having a limited time offer right now, only until the 14th. So we are just about five days away from the end of our special offer. If you sign up to become a patron, hit that orange red button over at patreon.com slash this week in science. Sign up at the $50 a month level. You will be eligible to get a piece of original art by Blair, some of the calendar corner art, the original pieces framed. And uh, that's when you support at that level for three months. So if you support for three months, we will send you a framed original piece of artwork by Blair. And that is only until October 14th. So if you're already at that level, you're in. If you're not at that level yet, you can get in there right now and become a patron at the $50 a month level. Get yourself a piece of framed art. Know that you are supporting us as we head into uh, the end of the year and that we you are helping us to uh, make this show happen and get the things done that we need to get done. So Patreon, you can click on the Patreon link at twist.org or you can go directly to patreon.com slash thisweekinscience. Thank you all for all that you do to help support Twist and to keep it going. We are listener supported at this point, and we love to be beholden to you. So thank you for all that you do for Twist. We really could not do any of it without you. Explain things you've heard with more than intuition. And we're back with more of this week in science. Oh, yeah, we are back again. Now it's time for this week in What Has Science Done for Me Lately? Lately. Our letter this week is from Tom Merritt. You recognize that name? Over that sounds familiar. The, yeah, host of the Daily Tech News Show. Friend of the show. Friend of the show, for sure. Tom writes in, says, what has science done for me lately? Science has granted me power. <laughs> he didn't put the laugh in. No. <laughs> <laughs> he goes on to say, Solar power, to be exact, thanks to advances in photovoltaic materials and, of course, the sun. I'm now feeding energy into the grid during the day and getting credit for the power I pull back out at night. Not only is this good for my power bill of, if it all goes well, it should be about zero for electricity on average. That sounds really good. Yeah, but during the day when air conditioning is straining the grid, I'm helping contribute, not just adding to the load, not to mention lowering emissions a little bit. That's good. So thanks, thanks science, for figuring out how to make photons into electrons in a way I can afford to do on top of my house. Thanks, science, for sure. Thank you, Tom, for writing in. Thank you for sharing your this week in what has science done for you lately. I know there are many other people who maybe are using solar power in California 
as the <laughs> electrical grid is being turned off. You have some, uh, any solar panels not connected to the grid that you can use to power things in your house, maybe? Yeah, California, you're under some things right now. But solar, I mean, if we can all pitch in in whatever way we can, it's amazing. And solar is getting more and more efficient. The science is it's mind boggling. It's wonderful what we are able to do now. And uh, one issue in urban heat islands is that of dark colored roofs causing increases in heating. And if that dark color is not just absorbing heat onto a, a roof tile, but into a solar panel, this light of the sun or, producing or both, electricity, actually. or both, it or could both. be great. Heating I, water. I, I, it, That's right. I actually saw uh, a building that for, I had to do a second take. At first, it looked like just an architectural design. The the tile roof was sparkling. Uh, I went, oh, that's kind of cool. Put a little uh, glimmer in there. Goes, oh no, those are that's that's tiled solar panels on mm -hmm. this roof. This yeah. is this is uh, this is they have captured. They're capturing energy for this building through the roof and 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 in and it's still in tile form. So it still has the the fit in sort of aesthetic with the building around, except you can kind of tell because there's that little bit of sparkle. Uh, uh, oh, it's like a on. unicorn house. Uh -huh. It's great. It's a big unicorn house. But yeah, I like the solar it's ivy too. the solar, solar ivy sparkle so pony. Pretty. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I want a solar sparkle pony house. That would be great. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And this was Science. and this was by the, this was a a large building too. This was like a maybe a four or five story building. Wow. Uh, where the entire rooftop of this uh, That's cool. commercial building. That's uh, cool. Very sunny, cool. So, yeah. Thanks, Science. Thanks, Tom. And if you have something you want to share with us, write in. Let me know. So you can send me an email at Kirsten, K-I-R-S-T-E-N, at thisweekinscience.com or leave a message on our Facebook page. That's facebook.com slash thisweekinscience. Just leave a message and help us keep filling this segment of the show with your stories and your notes and your, palm, your palms, no, your songs and your poems. And Anyway, it's yeah, time for some right. more science. Justin, oh, tell me a tell cool me. story. All right, what do we got here? Uh, next up, this is, this is, uh, this is. I, I goofed up. I said the previously. I started to say that microRNA RNAs were uh, involved in the uh, the antibiotic. That one was working on ribosome. This is one that's the, the, mm. yeah, the ribosome. Thank you. Um, this is one that is uh, actually uh, has the microRNAs in it, and it's cartilage in human joints. They're finding repair themselves through a process that's not unlike the regeneration that you see in salamanders and zebrafish uh, that use this to regenerate limbs. And, and part of this is sort of interesting. And there was a, something that had been noticed uh, medically over the years of treating humans, uh, which is that when there is an ankle injury, a knee injury or hip injury, the ankle injury seems to recover much quicker than the knee injury, which uh, recovers quicker than a hip injury. Hip injuries to cartilage can uh, become arthritic at higher rates than the knee, and the knee can become uh, at higher rates than the ankle. And what's sort of interesting is the process that uh, of, of this cartilage sort of repair is a, occurring in, with greater affect the at the the further away from the core of the body is the outer limbs, which is hmm. also the, the, it's also what happens with like a salamander tail or the outer extremities uh, on the zebra fish. It's the further, it's sort of like the furthest tips have greater regenerative ability. Uh, and this is this is researchers have further learned that microRNA regulate the process, and that these microRNAs are more active uh, in animals that are known for limb, fin, or tail repair, which adds the back to the salamander, zebrafish, and a number of lizards and this sort of thing. These microRNAs uh, that they discovered are part of the process of regeneration are also found in humans, uh, and it is they think an evolutionary artifact 
that is providing the capability for human joint tissue repair. And it's one that you could uh, quickly imagine why this would be conserved uh, in humans or maybe uh, pulled out of the dustbin a bit because humans for so long did so much running that cartilage repair would be absolutely something, that, oh, a trait that, that would, uh, through natural selection, uh, be very beneficial for what humans were going to survive. I just, I want to know. I Honestly, I know so many people with knee and hip injuries, you know. I mean, part of it is age. Yeah. <laughs> These knee and hip injuries tend to start popping up in your post 40s these think these these injuries start being deleterious um and maybe you know that's past the age of survival early in our <laughs> evolution um but yeah I, it I, i've always i mean even as a physiologist i mean i know that cartilage is it's all bone and cartilage this is all living tissue but at the same time cartilage is the thing you know does not repair it doesn't have uh, blood vessels. It doesn't, I mean, anybody who's had the, the cartilaginous part of their ear pierced will know that there's still a hole going through your ear because your the cartilage doesn't fix itself. If the cartilage in your knee gets messed up, you need to have knee surgery. It doesn't fix. So, it, but it, it turns out it does. And, and, and the that's, interesting... what's fa that's what's fascinating yeah. to me about this. But, and, and the interesting thing you see, you know, so many people with hip and knee injuries, um, but ankles, how many people yeah. are like, ah, I had a, uh, you know, uh, uh, mm -hmm. the cartilage in my ankle has gone bad. So I can, it, it because of, of this, uh, this discovery is answering the question as to why it is that you don't hear so much uh, about de debilitating ankle injuries Maybe, yeah. at the same, at the same rates. Right. So, mm -hmm. in, and, and those injuries may be just as common, uh, but it's a sprain and you wrap it and then, you stay off your foot for a couple of weeks and you're fine. So uh, they're calling it our inner salamander capacity. Uh, and they're, they're excited to learn what's regulating the regeneration uh, and, and the correlation to what's taking place in salamanders and humans. Uh, this is quotey voice from one of the researchers, Kraus who says, uh, we believe we could boost these regulators to fully regenerate degenerated cartilage in an arthritic joint. And if we can figure out what the regulators are missing compared to salamanders, we might even be able to add the missing components back and develop a way someday to generate part or all of an injured human limb. We believe this is a fundamental mechanism of repair that could be replied to many tissues, not just cartilage. So that, uh, uh, Blair? Hmm. The, uh, you know, if you're going to live forever, uh, <laughs> you're going to need healthy hip, knees, and ankles, and occasionally may need a new limb. I mean, by all means, sign me up. I could use a new, new right hand at this point. Huh? It's still giving me trouble. I drop things <laughs> oh. all the time. Yeah. But I'm very dubious. <laughs> like, I'm very, like, I don't... Uh, this, I, it sounds too much for me. The whole that sounds very Harry oh. Potter, like Skella grow, like time to grow some new bones. <laughs> I don't well, think so. It's just I, I, Wait, so, I do so, think so because we in do. The world of animals, though. Yeah, I mean, we see it in we see it in reptiles. We see it. We see limbs regrown. Uh, salamanders, you know, as the key example oh, here. Right tails regrown you know lizards lose their tails all the time so that they can escape a predator and then they're but they don't back. get their bones back okay but what we're talking about is cartilage <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah but no it's and the, which is the, the extra jump the extra yeah. jump kind of to to other things i right. think the cartilage makes sense to me absolutely like right. your ears but keep growing as you age what, even when you stop growing, right? So like there's there's other biological processes where that's not too hard for me to believe, but the the extra jump is is much harder for me. And I'm not to sure. say that it's impossible, but it, it is much harder for me to get and, there. And, and you're right. It may require a bone grafting thing of some sort to uh -huh. create the, the skeletal framework. But uh, there are, uh, I mean, 
think it's how much more complicated uh, can you get than than an eye? And mm-hmm. there are there are uh, is it fish and frogs that can that can do this? I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm remember the species but there are at least fish that can regenerate an eye that's been damaged mm-hmm. so i mean when you're talking about uh, what we're talking about here is cartilage because that's uh, yeah. what's being regenerated in this case but it's not the only thing that can uh, and in nature uh, mm-hmm. undergo this so yeah it would take some sciencing uh, but, to make it so it can be uh, yeah, but the, the translated basis- into other yeah, mm-hmm. the basis of this is not just cartilage, though. The basis of this are these mm-hmm. micro RNAs, which are these, uh, which go around and shut things off and turn things on. And yeah. if you have these little control molecules mm-hmm. that you figure out which ones control different aspects of cellular division and protein uh, translation, then you can go in and give some instructions Mm -hmm. to a damaged area of the body, you know, instead of maybe, you know, only doing, uh, you know, an idea now is stem cell transplants for the knee, right? If you have a damaged knee, you can put stem cells in there. The stem cells don't necessarily know what to do, but then if you know which micro RNA to turn on, at the same time, potentially you can create an environment that is conducive to the stem cells going, now I know what to do, and helping the cartilage grow. Or even just upregulating the cartilage fixing itself. And it, this is t- it, so, what so it is. And, it's and turning so on it light too. switches. It's turning things, opening up mm-hmm. the, the floodgates. Yeah. You know, it's turning it on, turning it off. Well, if you know how to control it. But, it's, and what it it's works. turning on and off, I think, is yeah. also interesting because then we're talking about uh, conserved DNA uh, that we may not be utilizing. Right. Uh, and, and now you've got something that can turn that switch on. And then you can also then uh, look and see, OK, well, maybe the machinery that's behind it isn't there. And so then you're talking about the genetic modification or uh, creating a a. Uh, creating a a pathway outside of the genetics to start that process uh, of regeneration. So you can either simulate what DNA has already been doing, or you may be able to turn on uh, that sort of latent DNA, DNA. That junk yeah. DNA that's that's been hanging around since fish. Uh, or hanging, just... or not since fish, hanging around since we started growing and then our bodies turned it off. Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. yeah. yeah, so yeah, much of this yeah, to regrow a limb, our body already did that once, and then it turned we, yeah, those right. genes off. <laughs> that's, that's, <laughs> it's just that's turn right. that yeah. turn those genes back on again. <laughs> we, we've done that but, before. But yeah. would it yeah. take twenty years to grow? No, no. Yeah, yeah. You'd regrow your Maybe. hand, Blair. But it'd be just two little baby. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> Of course, also oh. now I'm picturing in in uh, in trials that they try to grow so just some hip cartilage and they end up with a third leg. <laughs> oh, no, we hip. flipped the wrong you know, switch. You know, hey, if you can run with it, uh, run with it. It might be quicker. I think it'd be strictly <laughs> ornamental. You, you might win that three-legged race yet. That oh, after all, yeah. After yeah. all. Uh, moving on to some other crazy, awesome things that scientists are doing. Researchers have used optogenetics to implant a false memory into the brains of birds. Oh, okay. Yep. You said, oh hey, birds, oh you didn't goodness. really do this. You didn't really learn this. But now you know this. Mm. Oh, there was so, something like this so, with rats that we did just a few months ago, I think, right? Does that yeah, sound familiar? The, so it does a little, yes. And the optogenetics possibly, yes. Researchers in this particular study, which was published in Science, were looking at zebra finches, which are a model animal, my favorite from grad school, uh, that is often used to study bird song. The zebra finch song is great for the study because it's a very stereotyped song, but the babies learn the song from their fathers and they they go through a period of listening to the father sing the song. Diddle-loop, diddle-loop, diddle-loop. 
That's my little zebra finch <laughs> impersonation. <laughs> and then, so Lovely. after the listening takes place, the offspring, the male offspring, will then practice and they'll go and they'll make a bunch of mistakes and then they'll start to crystallize on the adult song, which is close to the copy of their parent song. There's also, there's a lot of stuff that's innate in there as well because it's stereotyped. The learning happens, but there's also a pattern in the bird's brain that allows the practice, this plastic part of the, the practice phase, uh, for a, compar- a comp- comparing within the brain. So the, the offspring knows I'm not doing this right and can pattern match to create the final song. And we know that there are very specific areas of the brain in the bird brain that are involved in creating this whole process. Um, And researchers have been studying this for a very long time. Excuse me, I just sneeze there. It's coming out there. Um, And there are several areas of the brain researchers have been looking at for a while. One of them is the HVC or the higher vocal center, which is for the production of the song. And so uh, a lot of areas of the brain in this whole process, researchers think mirror a lot of the wiring in the human brain and our own learning of speech and language and the production of language as well. And when uh, birds are learning a song, Their auditory cortex contains a region called the NIF, the nucleus interfacialis of the nidopallium, and the NIF connects to the HVC. So you have the heard song that then puts input into the motor production part of the system, allowing the animals to produce something similar to what they heard. Okay. This is where it gets really interesting. The And the researchers kind of took things over. So the researchers in this part of the study, they used optogenetics to bypass the actual listening part. They used light to trigger neurons in the NIF, that little area of the brain that sends information to the HVC. And they did so in a way that they would uh, leave the light on as if that was a note being sung by the tutor. So the longer the light would stay on, the that's the longer the sound that the young bird would want to produce later. And so in effect, they couldn't actually create a difference in uh in the sounds, so there's no melody and not a lot of variation, but they could create a pattern, a rhythm for this song. So it would be kind of, instead of a bird singing, doot 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 they would sing, doot-doot-doot, <laughs> doot-doot-doot, all the same sound. Um, but they showed that they could trigger the learning to take place. Birds that received the optogenetic light stimulation in the NIF area of their brain sang messed up songs that they thought they learned from a tutor, but they actually never did. They never heard a single song ever. Wow. Wow. And birds that they did not get that kind of training didn't sing at all. They didn't get a song. That's great. Yeah. That um, is wild. So I found a study, I don't know if we talked about this on the show, but it's sounding so familiar to me, from May of this year, where in, using optogenetics, they were able to kind of insert a memory into mice of a specific smell. Mm. Yes. So it's definitely, I mean, it's getting more complex, it sounds like. <laughs> It is. What I think is is fascinating here is this, uh, we are really starting to figure out the, I guess, the data processing part. I mean, there's still so much to learn, obviously, but we're learning this data input to processing to output a- aspect of the brain. 
And so what are the signals that a certain area of the brain needs to receive to make something happen? And it's this idea of the brain doesn't know what is real and what is fake. It just knows input. You know, it's like Johnny Five from Short Circuit. Mm-hmm. More input! More input! That's our brain. Uh, yeah. So, and it's, and it's something that's, I think, taken for granted nowadays. But you can go into an audio editing type program, generate a sound, manipulate that sound. You can... I've seen people who turn these into beats and uh, tunnels uh, so they can cr- cr- write music from scratch on a computer, uh, mm-hmm. which which we sort of take for granted. That's how things are done. Uh, but there was for most of rec- uh, playback history, at least recordable history, uh, you had to have a sound go in first uh, to put a sound out. And, and so what we are sort of like you said, tapping into the data generation uh, mechanics of the brain where you don't actually need uh, a specifically a sound input to to have a sound output memory uh, that's that can be played back which is yeah we're, we're starting to decode uh, brains in general which is, is is there is that a good thing is there a frightening application to this do we want brains to be programmable yes yes we do Yes, we do. We absolutely need uh, people to have programmable brains, uh, if for no reason other than to uh, create a dystopian increase. future. Of course, yes. <laughs> yes. Oh no, 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 that's no. how you start. You have to start with the human brain. Yeah. So I just want to let you know that the goal of this study, of the eventual goal, is not to program people's brains with false memories. Although you know it's kind of starting to look that way. You can do that the, from the outside already. <laughs> you it's can fine. exactly, yeah. uh, but the idea is that it, this is going to help us pinpoint uh, more specifically genes and neurons that are involved in language production, and that. Because of the similarities between the bird brain and the human brain, that we will be able to help individuals, human individuals, who have conditions that affect their ability to vocalize. Oh, so that's, interesting. You know, uh, that's the eventual goal is to understand the circuitry so that we can pinpoint it and fix it. Yeah. The, the first thing yeah, I, that, I honestly did think of, though, was... Uh, uh, there are forms of schizophrenia where people have audio hallucinations. Mm. So this is audio that's being generated from within the brain within. and not external. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so there, you can also, there's potential therapeutic uh, applications. Uh, Probably. In understanding and understanding how these things could be being generated. Uh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. So it's, it's pretty cool stuff. New, I mean, this is cutting edge research putting memories into uh as a as todd roberts a neuroscientist at the university of texas south texas southwestern o'donnell brain institute said this is the first time we have confirmed brain regions that encode behavioral goal memories those memories that guide us when we want to imitate anything from speech to learning the piano and the findings enabled us to implant these memories into the birds and guide the learning of their song Waha. Justin, tell me another story. So I have a discovery of a new family, genus, and species of microinvertebrate mm. uh, that doesn't have an ex- extant group of fossils that it fits into. And as of yet, they can't figure out if it has a current existing relative either. Oh. This is a 30 million year old fossil that was discovered in amber. Uh, the findings are by George Poinar Jr., the Oregon State University College of Science. And he's uh, informally calling the new animal mold pigs. Adorable. Because they have, mm-hmm. yeah, they have a resemblance, I guess, to swine. Actually, to me, it looks very much like a four-legged tardigrade. Yeah, they look like um, a tardigrade. Yeah, and the, a moldy tardigrade at that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, so, mo- so the the way they got the name uh, is pretty interesting. They so it says here too. He, uh, Pointer says uh, occasionally, as in the present case, a fragment of the original habitat from millions of years ago is preserved. 
the mold pigs can't be placed into the group of currently existing invertebrates. They don't have the extent uh, uh, fossil rel relative either. They share characteristics with both tardigrades and mites, but clearly belong to neither group. Uh, so they had, it's an interesting find because they didn't just find a one-off here. This is, they found several hundred individuals preserved in amber uh, and they can see their sort of uh, warm, moist surroundings with pseudoscorpions, nematodes, fungi, and protozoa. So they, you actually have the ecosystem that they were, they were living in. Uh, and because of the large number of fossils provided additional evidence of their biology, including reproductive behavior, development stages, and their food sources also could be sussed from this. So this is uh, really interesting. The discovery shows that, you, that this, this unique lineages were surviving mid, uh, well, 35-ish uh, million years ago, right? It's a, and it's sort of a snapshot and it's, you know, they don't know they don't know the history and they don't know its future. They think it fed mainly on fungi and supplementing that food source with other small invertebrates. But the thing that's sort of separating this from the mites and the tardigrades is that they don't have claws at the end of their legs, uh, for one thing. Hmm. Mm -hmm. So they can't grab onto things as well. Yeah. So it's a really interesting snapshot. A an alien uh, of sorts on our planet and that we we don't know exactly how it fits into this family tree. It's its, it's, a, what is it, its own genus, family, and, set, and species all, all in one there. It's just so can little... I speak to that for a second? Because as the resident who believes that tardigrades are aliens and, you know, Justin, you <laughs> might be with me on that one. This is kind of bursting my bubble a little bit that Aww. these guys are here and they're similar enough. They're filling a similar niche and they're here. They were here. It f makes tardigrades fit in the evolutionary timeline a little bit better because if there was this radiation of things like this living in water droplets, doing these things, then the tardigrade isn't so weird. And that's, <laughs> that makes me sad, but it does ground me a little bit better and make me think that, yeah, all right, maybe tardigrades are ours, but maybe they're not. Oh, <laughs> maybe oh, they're oh, both oh, from oh. outer space. Where? If you, yeah, but I feel like the they're probably they, both ours. Of course. Uh, but if you <laughs> did, if you did want to uh, hang on to your transpermia tardigrade uh, origin story. Yeah. You can say, oh, obviously that planet had an abundance of, of oh, tiny invertebrates. Okay. And we got like more they than were one. they were that planet's beetle. I yeah, like it was just everywhere. I, they both I ended prefer up the idea that maybe even though, you know, panspermia, that maybe things started here and tardigrades from Earth are spreading through the universe. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or moss uh, pigs. Maybe some moss, moss pigs got pigs got out before they went extinct. Mold pigs. <laughs> Now mold we have pigs. moss pigs mold and pigs. mold pigs. Yes. Moss pigs and both. mold pigs. There you go. Yes. Oh, it's good to have a veritable cornucopia of pigs. An abundance of pigs. An abundance. And In let's space. talk about let's talk about special striped cows now. Oh please mm -hmm. let's. Oh please what? let's. Yes. Researchers spurred on by so many studies that we have talked about on the show that, Blair, you have brought during the mm -hmm. Animal Corner about zebras, stripes, and what are they good for? Absolutely That's... nothing. No. <laughs> 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 uh, except maybe avoiding those biting fly yeah. attacks. Well, the researchers looked at the, the research and they said, oh, well, not a, we've got to put it on a different living animal and see if it works. And so they painted some cows. Great. Love it. Yes, they painted cows mm. in black and white stripes all over the body. And they just, you know, not a huge sample size. But then they checked to see what... Uh, how the how the animals fared in terms of insect bites and lo and behold the stripy cows were bitten less 
and also acted like they were bitten less. The the cows didn't have the stress behaviors that or the uh, bite avoidance behaviors to the same degree as non-striped cows. Wow. And so this is further evidence that um, painting a cow like a zebra could potentially keep it from being bitten by biting flies, which in some areas, because of the uh, amount of biting flies, can actually have a very detrimental effect on the uh, the agricultural the agricultural revenue from those cow herds. So, so we've got a picture recommending, of this. yeah, they're recommending that maybe the cow farmers should paint their cows. So, what about so genetically it, engineered cows to be striped? We've, we've, got, we've well. got a picture of this cow, and they didn't just put on some stripes. They, this looks, they really went to the extra effort to kind of try to recreate a zebra pattern here. This is a, uh, this is a pretty well done cow dressed up like a zebra. It's like Halloween came early to cow land. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this would definitely cause a double take driving by the pasture. So I think this is interesting what? because we uh, we had a study where people put horse coats on some horses that were zebra striped. But yes. in this case, some of the worst bites that can actually seriously hurt these cows are on their legs, which mm -hmm. is probably why they just went for it and painted them. Yeah. Yeah. They painted them all over. Uh, so, yeah, it was good. And the, they suggest that this would be a way that it's an alternative method of defending cattle against biting fly attacks and without fun, using uh, pesticides. Weekend. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a fun weekend project for the farm kids. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what are we doing today? We're going to go paint some, white, some cows. Here's some whitewash. Go paint your cows. So in, fence, in, in no colder cow. areas, perhaps cow sweaters are going to be a thing that are zebra striped. But oh uh, otherwise, I would say, yeah, some genetic engineering to make them striped would be pretty good. But I'm also hearing that when I go into biting insect territory, I should be wearing stripes. Which you I might had not really like thought about. You might want to look like a zebra. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Everyone, it's going to be the new field clothing line. Zebra skin, but not Love really it. zebra skin. Zebra stripes, yes. Uh, I've got a few quick stories for the end of the show. Um, so this one I absolutely love uh, because it just puts us in our place in the solar system. Voyager 1, as we know, is outside our solar system, right? It is, is past the, the edge of of our, what we consider our solar system, headed out toward the Oort cloud, toward the heliopause, and the, the, uh, past the termination shock. And Voyager 2 is well on its way in this, in this endeavor as well. Researchers wanted to know what kind of pressure, what kind of forces are out there at the edge of our solar system at that boundary between our solar system and the rest of space, interstellar space, right? So here on Earth, gravity, or not gravity, but here on Earth, we have air, yeah, anyway, here on Earth, air pressure. We know there's a bunch of molecules and they weigh down on us. And down here at sea level, it is a certain amount of pressure. And up at the top of a mountain, it is a different amount of pressure, less pressure, because there are fewer molecules pushing down on your head. Here at the surface of the Earth, it's one atmosphere of pressure, because you've got the whole atmosphere on top of you. When you go down beneath the ocean, you have more molecules pushing on you, greater pressure. But as we leave the solar system, you're leaving behind the, the particles that are contained in the solar wind. They push outward, but as they go ever outward, it's, it, it becomes fewer and fewer. So that pressure you would expect to be a bit less. And so researchers were using the Voyager 
spacecraft to figure out what was happening in these in the areas far away from the center of the solar system and they used a uh, they used an event called a global merged interaction interaction region say that three Ooh. times global merged interaction region this is caused by activity on the sun solar flares the solar flares fire out and they release bursts of particles right these are uh, so solar flares, otherwise known as CMEs or coronal mass ejections. They eject a bunch of particles into space at very high velocities. And as they travel out into space, they kind of create a wave, like a, a, a bow wave, to, if you can think of it that way, uh, creating a wave of plasma that gets pushed by magnetic waves. One wave like this reached the helio sheath in 2012, and Voyager 2 recorded what happened when that happened. Um, and then a few months later, scientists saw a similar event as a result of observations in Voyager 1. And in both of these, what they saw is that the wave caused the number of galactic, so stuff coming in, galactic cosmic rays, to decrease. So it was this pressure, this wave front from the sun pushed galactic cosmic waves away, repelled them a bit. So it increased those those coronal mass ejections that spread out particles from the sun that actually repel interstellar space particles. So they were able to take the distance between the spacecraft to calculate the pressure in the helio sheath and the speed of sound. So trivia for everyone, helio sheath speed of sound is 300 kilometers per second. It's much faster than it moves through air, so not much out there. They also noted that the change in cosmic galactic cosmic rays wasn't the same at both spacecraft. Voyager 2 had a different decrease than Voyager 1. Voyager 2 was still inside the solar system, and Voyager 1 was outside the solar system. And what they found at Voyager 1 is that only galactic cosmic rays traveling perpendicularly to our solar system's magnetic field decreased. And so there's an asymmetry, and so something happens. Researchers don't know what happens yet, but something happens as the wave transmits across the helio sheath, the boundary of our solar system. Something is different in the way that cosmic rays interact inside the helio sheath and outside the helio sheath with our sun's, with our sun's energy. So... Pressure, 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 pressure at the edge of our solar system. And all I can just think of is just how we're like in a bubble. That we've, our sun is creating this bubble that's zooming around space. And it's pretty awesome. What's going on outside that bubble? We got to find out. And then my last story for the evening is a story about new moons. If you've heard... Saturn got 20 new moons, brings it up to a total of, yeah, 82 moons. Go Saturn. The majority of these are really small, um, but now it apparently has more moons officially than Jupiter. So now is the top moon haver in our solar system. Researchers who have been working on this think that Saturn may have as many as 100 moons, but they're like little pieces of dust. The uh, the bits that are around are probably under a kilometer in size, so they're very hard to identify from where we are. But this means also that these 20 new moons need names, <laughs> and there is a contest from the Carnegie Institution for Science to help name the new moons. They must be named as the other moons of Saturn have been named. They must come from Inuit, Norse, or Gallic mythology. But you too could be a part of naming the 20 new moons of Saturn. We will have a link at our website. 
glad that they put a caveat on it. Uh, yeah. So we don't end up with a Mooney the moon face. Yeah. <laughs> I was thinking the same thing. <laughs> what do you mean? That was that's a not, home that's run not... the one time, and now it's just. Yeah. That's not Norse oh, mythology. No. No. <sighs> no. All right. Blair, what's in bird pee? Oh, my goodness. Well, first of all, I have to real quick explain for all of you that don't know that birds don't pee. <laughs> they don't have separate exit points for different types of waste. They have a cloaca, which I like to consider the Swiss army knife of orifices. They do everything. Um, and so out of it comes kind of this mixture of pee and poo. Um, the conventional knowledge is that urea is what's in mammal pee and uric acid is what's in birds, reptiles, and insect pee. And so this kind of differentiation, uh-oh, is in trouble. Um, a oh. recent uh, piece of research out of University of Texas at Austin looking at birds and bird excretions from um, the Austin Zoo have found no sign of uric acid in no sign. any samples. No sign. The Wait, analysis what? found ammonium urate and uh, struvite and two other unknown compounds, but absolutely no uric acid. The current hypothesis is that there is some sort of bacteria inside bird guts that break down the uric acid before excretion, but we are not sure. So everything that you think about bird poop and pee, like the reason that a, a bird poo on your car is really hard to clean off and might eat away at your paint, you always say it's the uric acid, but that might not be the case. So... How are we only just now just looking at that? Well, it's, it's interesting what I want to know. Bring that up what because happened? actually, there was um, someone named Bob Folk who, in the 1960s, posited this. He claimed that bird waste did not contain uric acid, and uh, generally speaking, he was laughed out of lecture halls, and um, he was he was kind of <laughs> told he didn't know what the heck he was talking about. He found no sign of uric acid in samples collected in 17 species in the 1960s. And so that uh, paper was published in 1969. It used x-ray diffraction and solubility tests and found nothing. Um, but so this newer study uh, was using some newer technologies, some of the same technologies, and looked at a, a pretty wide array of types of birds in the Austin Zoo and just found nothing wow huh. so mm -hmm. more more to look Goodness. for there i love this though the story here yeah it says that uh the researcher one of the the researchers julia clark um she had a conversation with bob folk who claimed that the waste didn't contain uric acid and mm -hmm. she says sometimes you just get presented with really weird question and you want to know the answer yeah. Mm -hmm. There you go. Yeah. So, so the first I'm thing, uh, the first thing it. well, I, I'm sure the first thing she looked at for was any paper anywhere that showed it being found. And then, and then that's a kind of an interesting null hit if you go and mm -hmm. look for, well, obviously there's a counter argument to what this person is saying. And you go and look and you're like, I should be able to find this. There should be a paper. There should be research done. There should be mm -hmm. somebody talking about utilizing or if it and if you don't find anything that's a big aha okay now we have to test now we have to do the look because you can't find it anywhere in the body of research it's i mean it's just so interesting because this was a test question in so many classes in college oh so many what is the waste yeah. product in in bird waste your guess mm -hmm. yep I know um, for a fact uh, that human pee is urea, and yeah. we I know this because of physiology lab, and we yeah, it's fine. This yeah. is not a question. And this isn't <laughs> saying that um, also perhaps, you know, uh, reptiles, amphibians, insects, that that's not found in there. Um, this is only saying for sure what they know about birds right now, which is yes. that birds appear to not have it. And the 
explanation just opens up new questions is Indeed. not that it was never there, but that there's some sort of process happening that's breaking it down is the current hypothesis. So lots yeah. of unanswered questions. It's gonna oh, lead to oh new yeah. Research. And the, the, yeah. The, the one I want answered first is how did this get entered into the body of knowledge? In the Where first place. Where did it place. come from? Mm -hmm. Great well, question. That's, that's, the, that's the first thing. It's like, how did that mm -hmm. start to the point where it could be a test question and yet was itself never mm -hmm. tested? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tell me a story about canned soup. Yeah, well, uh, this is Tel Aviv University researchers in collaboration with scholars from Spain have uncovered evidence of a two to 400,000 year old uh, canned goods <laughs> uh, in the Kesem cave near Tel Aviv. By canned goods, of course, we're talking about the storage and delayed consumption of animal bone marrow. You know, Tupperware. Was it was the Tupperware of yeah. the day. <laughs> Tupperware yeah. of the day. Yeah. So these I got a bone here. Yeah. People would save animal bones, they, they think, for up to about nine weeks before Whoa. feasting on them in the cave. Uh, they so they got all these bones. They've got all of them in sort of the, these interesting states uh, with skin still on them. Re researchers evaluated the preservation of bone marrow using uh, an experimental series on deer. They controlled exposure time, environmental parameters, combined with some chemical analysis. A uh, combination of archaeological and experimental results allowed them to isolate the specific marks linked to dry skin removal and determine a low rate of marrow fat degeneration of up to nine weeks of exposure. Uh, this is Cody voice of Dr. Belasco. We discovered that preserving the bone along with the skin for a period that could last for many weeks enabled early humans to break bone when necessary and eat still nutritious marrow inside. The bones were used as cans that preserved the bone marrow for a long period of time until the skin was taken off. Uh, shatter the bone, eat the marrow, says uh, Professor Barkai. So this is in the October uh, issue, ninth issue of Science Advances. And it's, it's, a, it's, it's kind of an interesting story because we have been conceiving of the center gatherers as needing to eat at the site of the kill almost, you know, like this is the, the environmental pressure on these hunters is that you always need to be killing something in order to, to eat. But this shows that they were actually already starting to figure out food preservation techniques. <coughs> What's also interesting. That's interesting about this cave is they don't know who these people were. Uh, they don't have uh, apparently any human remains to, mm -hmm. to, to say who this is. So this could be a homo erectus. This could be a Neanderthal. This could be early humans sort of uh, getting out ahead of the, uh, the out of Africa migrations or one of the earlier events of, but they, they as of yet, don't know who these who these people whose artifacts they've been sifting through are. Um, it's yeah. old, though. This uh, four hundred and twenty to two hundred thousand years ago. So that's yes, that's old. It's yes, yeah, it's very old. So so that, but it's and then where it is though is is sort of in the corridor of humans leaving Africa, Africa. or the current yeah. modern humans as we are defining them. Uh, mm -hmm. And is also areas that were inhabited by Neanderthals and Homo erectus. So there's there's right. a, there's just so many dang humans running around <laughs> the world at that point in time, uh, and in that location is sort of the nexus of a bunch of it. So yeah, don't know who they were. But one day maybe we'll find out. I hope that we're able to find out. That would be pretty interesting. But it just checks off another thing in the list. Fire? No, that was around for a long time. Uh, tool work? No. Glues? No, we had adhesives uh, uh, predate current modern humans. Oh, preservation of food. There you go. No. no but yes, there we go. <laughs> we have it. We have it. And we have done it. We have come to the end of another show. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow, wow, wow. I would love to say thank you to everyone 
out there. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Thank you to our chat room. Thank you to Gord McLeod for uh, monitoring our main chat room. Thank you to Fada for helping out over on YouTube and with our show descriptions on YouTube and our social media. That's huge. Identity 4, thank you for recording the show so that we have an audio podcast. And thank you to our Patreon sponsors. Thank you, Paul Disney, Ed Dyer, Andrew Swanson, Craig Landon, Andy Groh, Ed Stu Pollock, Philip Shane, Ken Hayes, Harrison Prather, Charlene Henry, Joshua Fury, Steve DeBell, Alex Wilson, Tony Steele, Richard Porter, Mark Mazaros, Jack Matthew Litwin, Jason Roberts, Bill K. Bob Calder, Time Jumper 319, Eric Knapp, Richard, Brian Condren, Dave Neighbor, Gome K. Donald Mundus, Sarah Forfar, Dan K, Matt Bass, Darwin Hannon, Patrick Pecoraro, Ben Bignell, Jean Tellier, John Gridley, Corinne Benton, Adam LaJoy, Sarah Chavis, Rodney, Tiffany Boyd, John Bertram, Mountain Sloth, Seth O'Gradney, Stephen Alberon, John Ratnaswamy, Dave Friedel, Daryl Myshak, Paul Ronovich, Sue Doster, Dave Wilkinson, Noodles, Kevin Reardon, Christoph Zucknerek, Ashish Pants, Ulysses Adkins, Artyom, Rick Ramos, Paul, John McKee, Jason Olds, Brian Carrington, Christopher Dreyer, Lisa Suzuki, Jim Drapeau, Greg Riley, Sean Lamb, Steve Leesman, Kurt Larson, Rudy Garcia, Marjorie Gary S., Robert Greg Briggs, Brendan Minish, Christopher Rappin, Flying Out, Aaron Lucen, Matt Sutter, Mark Hessen Flo, Kevin Parachan, Byron Lee, and EO. Thank you for all of your support on Patreon. And if you are interested in supporting us, you can find information at patreon.com slash this week in science or just click that Patreon link on our website. We are now running a limited time offer until October 14th. So act now, become a patron at the $50 a month level. On next week's show, once again, we will be back broadcasting live online with all the science that you love this show for at 8 p.m. Pacific time on Wednesday evening. You can watch it live and join our chat room at twist.org slash live. But don't worry if you can't make it because you can always find those past episodes at youtube.com slash this week in science or twist.org. Thank you for enjoying the show. Twist is also available as a podcast. Just Google This Week in Science anywhere good podcasts are found. If you did enjoy the show, remember to tell your friends about Twist. Blair, you're muted. Four. Oh my God. More. For more information on anything you've heard here today, show notes will be available on our website. What's our website? I'm so glad you asked. It's www.twist.org. While you're there, you can also make comments and start conversations with the hosts and other listeners. And while you're there, hey, maybe go ahead and just pre order some of those 2020 Blair's Animal Corner Twist calendars. Yes, or you can contact us directly. Email Kirsten at Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com, Justin at twistminion at gmail.com, or Blair at blairbaz at twist.org. Just be sure to put twist, T-W-I-S, somewhere in the subject line. Otherwise, what will happen to your email? Your email will be spam filtered into oblivion. You can also hit us up on the Twitter where we are at Twist Science at Dr. Kiki at Jackson Fly and at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you'd like us to cover, or address a suggestion for an interview, a haiku that comes to tonight, please let us know. We'll be back here next week, and we hope you'll join us again for more great science news. And if you've learned anything from this show, remember it's all in your head. <laughs> This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. is coming your way so everybody listen to what i say i use the scientific method for all that it's worth and i'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth because it's
it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news. Uh, But I've done the calculations and I've got a plan If you listen to the science, you may just yet understand That we're not trying to threaten your philosophy We're just trying to save the world from Jeopardy, Jeopardy, Jeopardy. And this week in science is coming away So everybody listen to everything we say And if you use our method instead of rolling a die We may rid the world of toxoplasma, God the eye It's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 Got a laundry list of items I want to address From stopping global hunger to dredging Loch Ness I'm trying to promote more rational thought And I'll try to answer any question you've got So how can I ever see the changes I seek When I can only set up shop one hour a week This week in science is coming your way You better just listen to what we say And if you've learned anything then please just remember it's all in your head Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science. This week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science. This week in science This week in science This week in science This week in science this week in science, this week in science, this week in science, this week in science. And we are now in the after show. Blair's tired. She's done. I see the tired Blair face. I can't keep my eyes open anymore. I know. Blair, you were amazing coming after your long day Thanks. of travel to be a part of the Ooh. show and bringing your A game as usual. Oh, thank you. Thank you for joining us tonight. It was I'm, wonderful was to have you. I was thrilled to be here. I was sorry to miss mm. so much of last week. But um, I was happy I got to pop on there for a second. So glad we were able to get you on last week. That was great. I, I mean, I was sad that we couldn't see you, but having, you know, being able to talk to you, that, you know, that was yeah. perfect. That was I'm wonderful. just frustrated because so the tech that was there was fine. But my iPad wouldn't let oh, me connect like, my wow. camera because it needed an update. But it wouldn't update because I was in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> you're like why i'm connected to the internet i should be able to do everything it was so far i was it's, like it's oh you my ipad like even though i'm in canada <laughs> like yeah I, uh, I that's annoying i have to update apple updates take like seven minutes i have time and then i went and it was I oh sorry no. you don't have permissions to do that here like what the because you might update the canadian version <sighs> Um, yeah. somebody asked me how close I got to a polar bear um, the closest I got to the wild polar bear was probably 50 feet wow but we were mm. on we were on the tundra buggy lodge so we were about 10 feet up in the air we had a metal grill um, and the bear wasn't going anywhere too close to us. If the bear was getting closer, they would have called a bear guard over. Um, and whenever you have your feet on the ground in polar bear country, except for when you're walking around town, which is pretty funny, um, you have to have a bear guard with you, which is somebody who's trained in 
like where to look and how to look for oncoming bears and and is rifle trained as well because they could be just hiding in the snow yes although <laughs> kiki did you know that that's a myth they don't cover their nose. They don't cover their nose. No. And I oh. learned that on this trip too. <laughs> okay. I don't feel so, so bad. Then. When I was a tour guide at the zoo <laughs> when I was in college, that was like something we all told the visitors. Of course, that was in, you know, 2006, 2007. But I should have still. known better, but it. I will say it was like 12 years ago. So that, that helps. But uh, regardless, uh, it's, it's, it's permeating <laughs> that, that whole idea, but it's totally not true. <laughs> Turns out they don't hide their noses. No. Um, but, oh, well. uh, but so actually they, so they a lot of the rocks, you. a lot of the rocks look just like, like a bear, but like <laughs> they just, when we were looking for them in binoculars and stuff, we'd be like, is that a, it's a rock. <laughs> is that a, <laughs> it's a rock. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> um yeah so uh yeah that was very very cool but then when you're walking around the town of churchill they just tell you just stay in a group and take your corners wide <laughs> take your corners wide yeah and then That's apparently also everybody's house <laughs> and everybody's car is always unlocked so that if there's a polar bear in the street, you can so you run can into any in house anywhere, from wherever you are. or car. Oh, wow. Yes. Wow. Uh-huh. That's awesome. That's yeah. a community taking care of each other. They're like, yeah. Just everybody, this is what we have to do here. Yeah. Well, it was wild. It's a town of 800 people. Oh, there's no stoplight. There's only wow. one four-way stop <laughs> in the whole town. <laughs> Look at this city girl. Ah, I finally went to a town without a stoplight. I have never experienced that. <laughs> That's hilarious, right there. That by itself is yeah. well worth the that trip. That was really wild. I was world. like, "What's? Where am I?" <laughs> you know, you you know, you don't have to travel that far from where you are. Where? Where would I have to go? In California? Yeah, I, where would I go? Yeah. Yeah, there's towns all over. All the, between, I don't know. But, I feel like in California, like I've been to, you maybe there are neighborhoods in cities no, in that the don't Central have, Valley. but like the, cent the Central yeah. Valley, there are plenty of small yeah, towns, little valley towns that are tiny. Right. Yeah, no you don't even have lights. to get all the way to the Central mm. Valley. On your way to the Central Valley, yeah. you will hit mm. towns. Yeah. Interesting. Yep. yep. Interesting. There are small towns. Uh, well, anyway. Oh, Someone in the chat room, uh, let's see, yeah, brought up SpaceX was going to give us low Earth orbit satellites and internet anywhere around the world. One broadband to rule them all. And they're going to do it, what, in two weeks or something? Yeah, like yeah, something yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Yeah. That's 10 weeks for getting a human test flight. Okay. For uh, testing the Dragon Crew Crew Dragon capsule, going to the International Space Station, they've been having a big uh, a big to do with the with NASA because right. they need permission. <laughs> they need permit. They, they need permission to go to the International Space Station. But there's also that what I didn't realize is there's this whole. I read an article today that there's this whole thing where Congress has to a appropriate the funds and give money to NASA. NASA is the organization that basically plans for everybody who's going up to the International Space Station and books flights for them, where they're like the space travel agency. But some of those flights, you know, were they, they have to book time on Russian Soyuz launches. And now Russia isn't in really great graces with us. And there's um, Iran-Syria sanctions that are supposed to be against Russia that apparently Congress has granted a, a stay in those sanctions so that NASA can work with Russia to get people to the International Space Station until about, I think it's, spring of 2020. So we're going to have like a, a couple of launches or in in early 2020, but then we don't have any more flights booked 
with Russia. The contracts, we don't have any more contracts with them. And so the question is, will we have our own vehicle to get astronauts to the International Space Station? Mm -hmm. Or are we going to have to work with, is Con is Congress going to have to do another like, oh, okay, you can work with Russia, even though you're not supposed to kind of thing? Or, um, yeah, we don't know what's going to happen. And so we've got Jim um, Bridenstine, the Bridenstein, the the NASA administrator, he's like, yeah, sure, we're gonna be getting there. I don't know if we're gonna do it. And then Elon Musk two days ago is like, ten weeks, we're gonna make this happen. Even though we hmm. last last test thing, we blew up stuff. But anyway, well, to be well, that to guy be said fair. he was gonna roll out the the um, Big Mac trucks three years ago. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate the aggressiveness of his timeline, but I'm skeptical. Right. Yeah. Is 10 weeks going to happen? I don't know. SpaceX, we'll see. Hmm. We'll see. So anyway, it's it's interesting because this is where the, 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 the space industry runs into politics. And how do you actually, like this space effort, International Space Station, it's an international effort, but how do you deal with that when one of your key partners is in trouble you know like hand slap you've been bad you have sanctions we're not supposed to work with you anymore <laughs> how, do, well, well, how do we do so, so, that it's, it's really so interesting should, and what, fascinating what we should be doing what we should be doing is innovating around it uh you know, th this yeah this is this is uh if yeah we we should not be relying on the Russians to get the space. No, it's which is, we, yeah, which is why we need the, we need SpaceX scenario. and we need, uh, we need Virgin. We need Blue Origin. We need all of the, all of the groups that are working on these capsules. Come on, let's get these things going. Let's get, let's get, yeah, American, ingen American ingenuity. Let's make it happen. Um, let's see, uh, Blair's tired, so we'll go to bed now. Does that sound good? Um, yeah. Oh. <laughs> Blair says thumbs up. Justin's had five cups of coffee, and he's yeah, now I, going to go just, run around the, the building. Sun is just coming up here. So yeah. <laughs> the sun's coming up. Um, Justin, were you able to find out about press passes to the? Oh no, uh, I did. I had not looked into it any further, but I think the events start Friday. So, uh, but yeah, there's a the thing. Yeah. I got to submit a. Uh, they want a press pass or a press card uh, submission. You don't really have one of these things, so uh, yeah, I might not be able to make it. We don't have a press card, but um, uh, yeah, when you show your business card and your passport. And... So I've oh, been yeah. able to media pass in as this week in science to yeah. uh, a number of events in the past, and and yeah. but they're usually academic or uh, yeah product presentation you think this one i think it's because there it's are political. high profile politicians mm -hmm. who are going to be there uh and they are a, a, they don't want just anybody walking up to a panel and asking a question no it's, yeah. I, it's less i think they're worried about people asking questions than mm -hmm. they are about you know the uh, polarized nature of politics being what they are uh something worse than that so mm -hmm. I would understand mm -hmm. for security reasons why they want somebody who has been vetted by an institution and a union and what have you. Yeah. Uh, oh, but at the same time, uh, I know this this conference, it's like, you know, it's a, it's a, there's a big educational component. And I don't know, there might be more and, and, space kind of and science is a big aspect of it i think it so is, it's, it, most of the think the speakers are uh mayors mm -hmm. from around the world uh yeah. there's a there's a lot of mayors talking about what they have done in their local cities. community wise to, i want to know to, about that i yeah, want to like know really, uh, really fascinating talks going on so i hope you uh, can get in you should go you're how's denmark <sighs> Oh, it's uh, wonderful. Uh, it's been sunny, and then it will stop being sunny and be cloudy and rainy, and then it'll flip right back again. Uh, and it's it's beautiful. 
Uh, and if you're in uh, Copenhagen, uh, I got to go walk around central Copenhagen uh, the other day. And yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's really, it's really a different, place. first of all, they have, uh, did you sing have wonderful, survive. wonderful Copenhagen? <laughs> no, I don't even know this one. Oh, it's um, from the Danny K film. Um, Hans Christian Andersen. I don't know. So. Wonderful, wonderful Copenhagen <laughs> by the sea. <laughs> you can tell I'm so tired. Really I'm it. divided. I'm really <laughs> okay, hold on. <laughs> you have to find it now. Yeah. Are you eating only cheese and bread? <sighs> Uh, a large, a large amount of both. Yeah, actually. <laughs> so, so this is this is something that is uh, that is tricky uh, for somebody who lives in a society and a culture that predominantly eats out. Um, it's it's a bit of a novelty. There's not as many restaurants, and they're they're a little bit ex on the expensive side. So you're supposed to uh, make your own food uh, in Denmark, but uh, but there are interesting things like there's legitimate bakeries where you go right. and just get baked goods, and then there's another place you can go that's like the butcher or the candlestick maker. But like they have like there's a lot of uh, it's really there's a lot of small businesses. Uh, that's cool. That seem to be yeah. That's how things were in Israel. You went to the druggist to get your shampoo and then you went to like the the supermarket to get your garbage bags and then you went to the carrot guy to get your carrots and it was like very it was very specific little stories yeah. Yeah. i like that uh, but I, it's I, really I, it yeah. it's also an interesting city because uh it is uh, pretty much the whole country is this city uh, and so they have, uh, universities and research facilities and there are, I went to this really amazing art show. Uh, so the artist community is located in the city. So, you know how, like in the, in the States, like if there's the, the Danish film industry is headquartered in the city. So you, in America, it's like, oh, film industry. Yeah. You go to LA for that. Uh, if you were doing uh radio you might need to be in new york if you're uh, into art maybe maybe right now detroit is where the artists are are really you know where the, the center of the art is coming out uh all of these different cities that have you know research it might be a silicon valley type thing or you know bay area uh but the way it is laid out here it's everything is here in the same place all at once and i think that's it adds to a, an element of uh diverse vibrance and you know, this is this is the foodiest city in Denmark. This is this is hmm. where if you want to go see theater, this is where you go in Denmark. Uh, if you want whatever it is, whatever people do uh, that somehow gets spread out and city specific in the United States, it's all here in the same city. So it's pretty amazing from that. Cool. Are you are you feeling like you're uh, over your jet lag, or are you still? Yeah, up until I'm like, doing the show. Everything. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, have a wonderful day in yes. beautiful yeah. in the beautiful city, Blair. Have a wonderful night's sleep. Oh, I shall. Yes. Say good night, Blair. Good night, Blair. Say good night, Justin. I I can't. It's morning. Say good morning, Justin. Good morning, Justin. Okay. <laughs> Good, Good night, night Kiki. Good night, everyone. Have a wonderful night. Have a wonderful week ahead. And we really look forward to seeing you again next week for more This Week in Science.